Take your Bible, if you will, please. A quick verse of Scripture and a principle. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. There's a principle in the Bible that as Christians, we're not very good at practicing it. It requires, as the chief said, Brother Mike said, it requires practice. Oftentimes things in the Christian life, they're not like salvation. They require not just a rechanging or a, a re-rigging of the way that you think, but in order to get those things firmly established, it's more than just putting on the new man. It requires practicing things that we're not by nature prone to do. We can ingrain bad habits, or we can ingrain good habits. Habits are not always bad things, but bad habits are as hard to get out of as getting out of an easy chair. Easy to get into, very hard to get out of. And one of the things that's happened, and let me just say this, I'm no less guilty, so you're going to hear some confession or some profession from me today, as your pastor, I'm no less guilty than you are of the number one sin among Christians today. I've done exactly what I'm going to show you that we all fall short of today. Because it is a sinful thing when God gives us a command and we don't do what He says in obedience. Would you agree with that? In 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, Verse number 15, it'll just set the foundation, the principle. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. When was the last time that you thanked God for that unspeakable gift of Jesus Christ and your salvation? When was the last time that you thanked God for all things, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you? When was the last time that you let the peace of God rule in your heart and give thanks always for all things? When was the last time that you entered into His gates with praise and thanksgiving? When was the last time that you said to the Lord, I'm not here to ask for anything, I'm here to give something. I want to tell you how grateful I am. And the laundry list comes out. If God were to judge you and I today based upon us walking with Him, I wonder if we woke up with Him as did the twelve apostles and in the morning He judged us based on our prayer life. I wonder what He would think of us, of how we think of Him. I wonder how many times I have failed to say, hey, could I just pause for a moment and say, well, you sure have been good to me. I'm sure I'm glad I can taste food. I'm sure I'm glad I can feel warmth. I'm sure I'm grateful I can see beautiful things. I'm sure I'm grateful I can hear good things. I'm sure I'm glad you allow me to, to speak the right things. Grateful for the change in my heart. Grateful for the roof over my head. Grateful for a car to drive instead of a horse and buggy or have to use my shoes. Grateful for when was the last time? It's not intended to be a rebuke. It's intended to be a reminder. I'm going to show you some things. Brother Larry, you pray, if you would, please, before I get too carried away here and see what God will do for us. Well, Lord, thank you for another opportunity to pray. And uh, Lord, an opportunity to be in this meeting this morning. For this church, we give you the glory now for what you've done here, what you're doing, and uh, the message that we're going to hear. We give you the glory in advance for what is going to be said. In saying that, Lord... I pray, God, that we would not soon take for granted the seriousness of the hour. Uh, Lord, or lay aside anything, Lord, that we need to be dealt with about. I pray, God, for our hearts, especially this morning. Realize we can't fix them ourselves, Lord. We know we have a free will, but we need the, the plowing of the Word of God, uh, Lord, within us to help us to do that work. Thank you for the Holy Spirit of God. And I pray now you'd use your man, your preacher, to give us this word, this message, our Lord, that's on his heart. I pray you'd use it now 
I thank you for all that you're going to do in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Definition of gratitude is to receive something of great value from someone else. I guess sometimes we would have to pause and think a minute and think, well, maybe the reason I'm not grateful is I don't really think what I got was of great value. I think sometimes that what we do as Christians, we oftentimes put ourselves in a position to get saved and thank God that we are saved, but then we go back to employing what we know. That's put ourselves first or our business plan in place or uh, we attack it like we do any other problem instead of recognizing that there are certain benefits to just being grateful for what God's done, for His unspeakable gift. I wrote down a couple of things this morning. I'm going to show you some research in a second. I shouldn't have to utilize research to try to entice you to tell you how important this one element is. But it is so important that all through the Pauline epistles and even into the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament, God is constantly having to remind His people, Hey, did you forget something? I've told you the illustration many times before. I saw it in a picture. It burned in indelibly. I think of it every year. There's a guy making out his Christmas list and in the back is like a watermark of the Lord that's back here behind him looking over his shoulders and he's got everybody on that list. You can name, you know, bosses and family and friends and children and, and so on and so forth down there. And he's got the pencil up and he's got a question mark and the little bubble over his head said, Hmm, have I forgotten anyone? And Jesus is right there. When was the last time that you thank God that by His grace and by His mercy that you were allowed to even get saved? You say, what is it? The Lord said it's unspeakable. What was the gift? It wasn't your salvation, it was Him. That provided your salvation. I wrote this down this morning. I'm grateful that I'm saved. I'm grateful that His love endures forever and forever. I'm grateful that my sins are forgiven and I can get back in fellowship when I mess up. I'm grateful for the Bible that He gave me. I'm grateful for a church home. I'm grateful that He promised to provide for my needs and that I can do all things through Him. I'm grateful that I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm grateful I don't have to work to get there or work to stay there. I'm grateful that I woke up this morning. I'm grateful that He hears my prayers. I'm grateful that He convicts me when I'm wrong. I, I'm, I, I'm, I realize though that when I was going through this that I recognize there's conviction speaking there. I'll say oftentimes I might have a laundry list of things that I think He should do or things that need to be done. But I failed on my end of things to come to Him and say, Lord, You tell me I'm to be thankful for all things for the sickness and for the disease and for the trouble and for the trials and for the discord and all that. You said all things. Again, I don't know about you. I can't answer for you. I think you're probably no less guilty than I am, but I can't point a finger at you because there's three pointing back at me. I realize that my attitude and my way of looking at things sometimes in life based upon what I did for a number of years is oftentimes my justification for willingly sinning against God because God told me what I'm supposed to be doing is I'm supposed to be grateful, I'm supposed to be thankful for all things. For in that lies the fact that it really is faith to recognize that if God allows in His permissive will for something to happen to me, for me to say, Lord, thank you for this, it's... it. It shouldn't be that it benefits me to do it. It should be done because it's right to do it. I don't know if you ever worked for somebody and they never even pause for just a moment to tell you, hey, I appreciate the job. You know, if they come respond to you like, hey, that's what I pay for. I mean, you may still do the job, but you know what? A little bit goes a long way sometimes when an individual comes and says, hey, I appreciate it. You did a great job. Even if it wasn't for free, it's nice to hear sometimes. I I realize sometimes even in a marriage, you know what can happen? You can kind of take things for granted. I woke up and I actually looked up and threw a little crack in the blinds. I guess I didn't close them all the way last night. I looked up there and I, I saw some stars this morning. 
And the Lord said, you know how many people can't see stars? You know how many people can't tell if it's dark outside or light outside? I, I immediately, I, I, I fell under conviction and I, I went into the, ba- into the bathroom and then I went into the kitchen and I got me a cup of coffee and I'm smelling the coffee brewing and, I'm, and, and the Lord says to me, you realize how many people that not only can't enjoy the taste of it, we got a fancy coffee thing. I look forward to drinking coffee in the morning. It just tastes so good. The Lord said, do you realize how many people can't even smell it, let alone taste it? You know how many people would love to just be able to have the taste of, of that coffee in the morning? And I get a hold of that thing and, and I had turned the thermostat way down and I'm thinking, man, it's a little bit chilly and it is hitting me every which way I go and I walk over without even thinking, coffee in this hand, and reach up there to the thermostat and go dink, dink, dink. <laughs> and immediately that thing goes and the heat, it starts coming out and the Lord said, nice to have a warm house, isn't it? Amen. Nice to know that the bill's paid. You can just kick it up a little bit and within just a matter of moments you got hot coffee in your hand and you got the temperature turned up. And I began to walk up the stairs to go to my office still under heavy conviction and the Lord said, you know how many people have to live in one story and they have to wheel around and roll around and get somebody to help them to get to the bathroom and, and that kind of a thing. You realize how many people, they may not be able to run up the stairs, but they can walk up the stairs. You, do you realize? And I'm thinking, my goodness, man. I'm talking about a lack of gratitude for things I took for granted. I sat down in my office chair and I opened up the book. It fell on Psalms 100. Enter into his gates with praise and thanksgiving. And I thought, man, maybe the reason I had been outside the house is because I am guilty of not giving him praise and thanksgiving even when things aren't going right. When pressure is on greater than it's been in a very, very long time and difficult times are going on and the Lord's like, I didn't say that just because of what you're going through that that changes. And I sat down there and I began to read and the Lord said, uh, not only can you see stars, you can see my words. That first cup of coffee crossed my lips just to sip, cooled off enough that I could taste it. And I thought, man, there's hundreds of taste buds in my mouth that are singing praises to Jesus right now. But it wasn't for an unspeakable gift. It was because I could enjoy the taste of something. And I got to thinking about church. I got up this morning with a purpose. I had a place to go. And a person to worship. I had a Bible to be the lamp to my feet and the light to my path. And I... My life has reason. It has meaning. Whether it means anything to you or not, I, I, it's not a matter of who gets what when you get there. It's a matter of, hey, I'm saved. I'm going home to heaven. I, I may be a soup sandwich, but man, how bad a day can I have? I mean, my ticket is already punched. It's already paid for. I, I'm headed out of here. And however long the suffering might last, it's only going to be infantile, momentary compared to eternity. It's absolutely nothing. And I began to pause and ponder and I thought, you know what? I now recognize the Apostle Paul when he says, going through the troubles he went through in 2 Corinthians 11 and then again into 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, I think I know Paul's secret. You say it was being called up to heaven. No, I don't believe that was it. I believe when I start reading the Apostle Paul's writings and I see that word thanks show up so many times, I believe the Apostle Paul recognized that I know how to be abased and I know how to abound and I know that without Jesus Christ I am nothing, just like you heard Brother Mike say. And he got up there and he began to say, you know something, without him I'd have been following the law and then I'd have died and gone to hell. But when I met him on the road to Damascus, my life has never been the same. And I believe the way that the Apostle Paul was able to go through everything he did was because because he was grateful for everything he went through. And if Paul's my apostle and I'm to follow him, why well, I don't even do it in practice. I wrote this down. This is from some pretty high dollar sources. This is from people at Harvard University and, and some kind of things like that. This is what they say. 
This is secular world now, so you, so, so you take this with a grain of salt. I just wrote these things down and doing a little bit of research, okay? Here's what being grateful does. It increases your optimism and reduces stress. Sign me up. I live in a glass half empty society. For a long time, listen ladies and gentlemen, I have to check myself. I am not the glass half full guy. That doesn't make it right. I should at least be the glass half full guy 50% of the time if I got the right balance. I can find something wrong with everything. I will overlook 90 good things for that one bad thing. Please understand, I was trained that way. I never gave out a single thing. Never once did I stop somebody and give them a ticket for driving good. I could literally sit somewhere and in a matter of moments I could find critically somebody that was doing something wrong and I could write a fistful of tickets in less than an hour. You say, why? It's so easy to find the hundreds of thousands of people that are doing right. I'm just picking out the things that are wrong. I could walk into a crowded room back in the day, maybe not as much now. And within a very short period of time, I can tell you, oh, okay, you better watch that guy, better watch that girl, better watch this, you better watch that. Because I was always looking for the negative. It's not an excuse, it's a fact. But what happened is, is I quickly became justified that the glass is half empty. You know what's easy to do with Christians? It's easy to see all the ones that are doing everything that you wouldn't do. And caught myself, even as a preacher, going, what about all the ones that are doing what they should do? <laughs> the majority of sermons nowadays are built around people that are not doing what they ought to do instead of, the Bible says, reprove, yes, rebuke, yes, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. There should be at least a third of what we do for each other and a third of coming out of the pulpit that is not just a rebuke and it's not just chastisement and it's not just instruction and righteousness, but an exhortation. Hey, you're doing good! You got to church today. God bless your heart! Amen. Amen. You threw a little bit in the offering plate. Good for you! You read your Bible. Maybe you didn't read every day, but you read some. You prayed and were thankful to God. Good for you. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can get into a situation where we think that the Christian life is the Lord just sitting up there and all He wants to do is just criticize us for everything we're not doing. I can tell you in my own personal life, He doesn't waste a lot of time criticizing me. But he does spend a lot of time trying to encourage me. Amen. I got a good father. Amen. But I think sometimes that my way of talking to him and talking about him to other people, it doesn't really make him altogether lovely. It doesn't really make him a good father. It kind of kind of brings him, makes him suspect because it's like, well, God's going to get on me and God's going to paddle my britches and God's going to burn me up in the judgment seat and God's going to do this and God's going to do that. And he is a God of wrath and he is a God of anger and he is a God of holiness and he is a God of, of all those kind of things. Yeah, but they're so balanced out in my own life with God of mercy and God of grace and God of long suffering. And and a forgiving God, and a good God, and a gracious God, and a tolerant God, I might even say. But if He were to judge my prayer life and judge me by my prayer life, I dare say I'm way out of balance. I'm preaching to me now, not to you. Don't take it personal. I'm simply saying that if my conversations with the Lord are indicative of what I think that He's thinking then all of a sudden my prayers become very selfish and very self-centered like, Lord, I know I'm, I'm the most important thing in your world, the most important thing in your life, and I, I need you to answer all these things. I mean, after all, aren't you my Instacart shopper? I need the following things, Lord. And uh, look, I know there's a slight delivery charge and stuff, or I know they upsell things and that kind of a deal. I'm willing to pay that for the convenience of sitting on my blessed assurance, not having to do anything. But I expect you to get with it now. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. 
I'm talking about recognizing that in my Christian life, though I may have some grasp of a few things that are in the Bible, that if I were to be judged at the judgment seat on whether I'm grateful or not, based upon what I say and think in my prayer life, I will come up short. As if to say, God's not been good to me. If He is good to me, why hasn't there been praise and thanksgiving? If He has been good to me, why hasn't there been as many prayers about that? Why haven't there been as many prayers about that as there have been my complaints, my gripes, my I need this, I need that, you got to do this, you got to do that, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. I mean, I stay in a panic-stricken lifestyle if that's what He goes by. It's like, what do you need now? The world's coming to an end. Oh my goodness. Oh my, oh, I can't oh, swear by myself. So I mean, I, man, you are in a real mess. In my prayer life, rarely ever am I coming and saying, I just want to give you some accolades this morning. I've taken way too many things. For granted, I talked to a young man yesterday for a few minutes and his heart is broken over something that occurred. I mean truly broken. And there's a tragic loss that has occurred. And I said, I'll say this to you, brother, what a blessing. And he goes, I know, I'm supposed to suffer. I said, no, 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 no. What a blessing that you cared that deeply and loved that strongly that it hurts this bad when you had to put them in the ground. Would you have rather not loved like that than to have the pain that is indicative of I really did love her. She meant the world to me. I don't know how I'm going to live without her. Oh my goodness, what a blessing. I wish I had loved her more and told her more often and now she's gone and it hurts so bad. Would you rather not hurt? No, he said, I never looked at it that way. He said, I guess it's good to hurt. I said, it's just an indicator that you really love them. Hey, you've lost loved ones, haven't you? And it hurts, doesn't it? But would you rather have not cared about them and lost them? Or would you rather care about them and hurt the way you do to just shows how much you loved them? But I wonder if I were to use that illustration that I used with him, would I really miss the Lord? Would it bother me if the fellowship was cut off? Would I grieve like I buried a dog? Well, it's just a dog, like a kid to me. Would I grieve because I lost a loved one, dear friends, if I lost my fellowship with the Lord? Would it bother me that bad? Would He even know that I was missing for any other reason than He would not hear me complaining all the time? About everything! Like God's not a good God. I'm just talking about my prayer life. Preacher, don't you pray? Oh man, I pray. But I've been evaluating. If I was Him listening to me, I'd be like, Oh God, here He comes again. You ever had somebody working for you like that? Y'all are like, yeah. I hope you're not that person. <laughs> here they're like, oh boy, here we go. I wonder if the Lord, you know, it's like, hey, Michael, Gabriel, here comes. Oh man, never mind. We're going to be a while. He's going to tell me everything that's wrong and every problem that everybody has and all the troubles and all the difficulties and how he's not doing whatever. Y'all can just go ahead and go. He prays the prayer that millions have been praying for years. I think God enjoyed hearing David pray. Have you ever read through the Psalms? That's going with my regular Bible reading now. I'm just reading through the Psalms. Do you know that there is a lot of things in the book of Psalms where David's dealing with trouble? Do you realize how many times thanksgiving and gratitude are showing up in that in spite of the trouble and stuff like that? I think God's like, David, you know what? It's a great balance because I know with all your complaints and troubles, I know somewhere in there you're going to give me an attaboy. You're going to say thank you. I think it probably make my prayers a little more tolerant if every now and then I said, oh, and by the way, Jesus, sure appreciate you. 
I know I like to hear that. Can I get in the flesh for a second? I know I'm a preacher and I'm not supposed to be. But when somebody says, hey, that was good. Hey, you helped me. It helps me, but now I'm under conviction. The Lord's like, oh, yeah. You know, maybe you would get more compliments even if you get in the flesh and even if you take it the wrong way and even if you think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread and all the stuff you do wrong with it because that's how Christians do, right? Don't get the big head. But I sure appreciate you counting the beans. But now, I'm, I mean, I don't want you to... Right? Isn't that how we do it? So I was thinking, I go to the Lord. Now, Lord, don't get the big head. I just want to tell you, I think you did a great thing saving me. Can't imagine the body of Christ without me. I mean, I know you're running short on people. It's a good thing you called me. You say, preacher, that's ludicrous. Yeah, but a lack of being grateful, it kind of takes on that tone. It kind of takes on the tone of, I don't need to be grateful. I mean, after all, I did you the favor. Maybe you've been that way. I don't know. Maybe not. I, I can just simply tell you that if the Lord were to take my prayer life and look at it, His judgment of me would be that I'm in it for me. I'm intentionally pausing for effect. How about your prayer life? Do you realize that the things I'm going to show you from a secular standpoint, God puts the stuff in the Bible and I'm thinking, well, it's just right, it's just right, it's just right. But then when I did this study and I recognized this stuff, I'm kind of like, wow, God actually put that in there because it's actually good for me physically, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, maritally, every kind of way across the board. This one nugget in and of itself is a huge game changer. It is the magic pill. And a lack of it is certain death. And I begin to realize, man, I really don't know as much as I think I do about Christianity. I haven't learned the simple lesson of gratitude. You have ten lepers over there in Luke 17. And the Lord is so enamored with one out of ten... And the reason he's enamored with them is, is the Bible said that that one came back. And the first thing the Lord said is, where are the nine? Here's how I saw that. David, brother Mitch was here, but where were you? The one grateful came to return, leper that came to return to give thanks. He's here. But where are the nine? I did the same thing for them that I did for him. Why is it we never distinguish ourselves as anything other than a great soul winner, a great preacher, a great giver, a great doer, a great beer, when was the last time somebody said, you know something, getting around that person is like, man, they are just grateful for everything. Let me ask you a question. This is intended to be uh, uh, self-searching. Would you be the one that came back or would you be in the group of the nine? Don't lie to God. I'm not, I'm not saying it out loud. More often than not, have you been in the nine or the one? If you've been in the nine, can I say that I have something for you today? Amen. But God would point a finger at us today and instead of saying you smoke and you drink and you cuss and you chew and you run around and you fornicate and commit adultery and you commit murder and you're evil and you're envious and you covetous and you backbite and you do all this kind of stuff, all the Lord would have to say, those are symptomatic of a deep, deeper problem. Because if you were truly grateful for what I did for you, those things would dissipate. Amen. The greatest sin of American Christians is the sin of ingratitude. And Bob Jones Sr. said it correctly. The first moment that ingratitude arises, it is the first step toward absolute and total apostasy. 
Because you can doctrinally do everything right, cross every T, dot every I, and rightly divide down to a fare thee well. But if you're not grateful, it's the kiss of death on a Christian. And all the Lord would have to say is, is that I have somewhat against thee. What happened, Lord? We're busy as all get out. Yeah, but you left something. You left me. I remember a lot of years ago, and some of you will think this is really carnal, I helped my dad rebuild a, a Ford Thunderbird. Ultimately what he did was he bought a car that was in really bad shape. That's back in the days that it had a, a, a Ford 351 in it. 289 was later on down. The Ford Thunderbird's a heavy car. And we pulled it out with A-frame and old chain hoist. Brother Larry, some of you older guys will know what that is. We work when I got home from school and Daddy got home from work and got done with practice or whatever. And we'd go out there and we'd work in the garage, a carport. It was cold out there. and We thought we had died and gone to heaven when Bill Fryer brought out a little torpedo heater and you'd turn it on, it looked like a jet engine and that thing would blow in. Man, we thought, man, this is good as it gets. And you get out there and turn those wrenches and fix all that stuff and finally got it all fixed up and... I mean, we carpeted it, and he took it to the upholstery place and got me new seats and stuff in it. And yeah, I was proud of it. I was proud as a peacock. <laughs> and my dad, while I was at school one day, he came by and he uh, picked my car up. I didn't know he had it. And I would get in my car and I would leave from there and drive out to Callahan and work on a cattle farm out there and then come back home at nighttime. And as a senior, he came and picked it up. and. When I got back there to school, I noticed there's a, a tape deck in there. Eight track. Yeah, I know. <laughs> now, I'm ashamed of what I'm about to say, but it illustrates the point. My dad had scraped together a few dollars and he managed to get what he could afford to get me an eight track, uh, four channel uh, tape player put the speakers in, he did it all himself. Got it in there. Here's how I greeted him. Dad, I sure do appreciate that. You know Jimmy Smith? He's got this one that sits there, it's on a swivel, and like, so people can't steal it. You can swivel it this way and push a button and you can take it off. And he's got six speakers and he's got this. And I can remember to this day, the look on my dad's face. There ain't no backing up on that one. After I realized what I did, I said, I'm sorry, but it paled in comparison that he had gone out of his way to give me what he could, but didn't compare to what I wanted. Somebody that had the dollars and somebody to install it professionally, all I had was an old man just did the best that he could do. Comparatively, could I ask you this question? The forgiveness of the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, I sure do appreciate it, but... Did you see what she... You know what I know about gratitude? Gratitude staunches, it stops covetousness because you're grateful for what you have. Paul said, I, I know whatsoever state I'm in there with to be... To be what? Godliness with con what? Contentment is... It stops covetousness. It stops the race against other people. It, it means, hey, I'm glad I got what I got. Thank God for it. I don't have to have more to be happy. I got what I got. Man, what a blessing. I'm happy. But you're miserable, aren't you? Why are you miserable? I mean, if He's a good God, it doesn't represent the Father very well, does it? It's like working for somebody and you go out and you're working because they're paying you for a task that you're doing, but all you do is badmouth your boss all the time. But you're willing to take their money. It's how we represent Jesus Christ. He's a good God, but... I don't know why He... In everything, give thanks. 
For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning... I wrote these things down from a Harvard study and from a, another study from... It just slipped my mind. I should have written it down. Being grateful, they found out using MRIs changes your brain chemistry. I don't understand all of this, but what it does is, is it reduces it and it produces a subject or a, pro, a, a, a hormone called oxytocin, which just makes you feel good. It's natural. It's very calming. It's very, very peaceful. It puts into place that fight or flight mode that you feel, that you're feeling trapped and you feel like all of a sudden fight or flight goes out the window because it now has hijacked your parasympathetic nervous system. And just being grateful prevents you from always feeling that you're under attack. I don't feel that way! Okay. Sure. Could have fooled me. It increases sleep. Who don't want that? You get more satisfaction out of little things. Your physical health improves. Your inflammation decreases. It increases your patience, your humility, your wisdom. It will strengthen your relationship with others. You're less likely to burn out or get fatigue. And it will automatically disconnect you from toxic environments and people. Being grateful actually works like a magnet. It draws you and other people together, not apart. Who would have ever thought that my reason for not having more friends, that the problem's me not being grateful for the Lord, from whom all blessings flow. Who would have thought that the answer to the problem is me just saying, thank you, Lord, I sure appreciate it. I like the song. I was going to have Brother Sam sing it today, but I thought it might have been a little over the top. Amazing Grace was a great thing. I don't know if you all picked up on it, but their salvation has been mentioned about six times in here, and Brother Sam was fishing the pond earlier about it, and so somebody must be here that's lost. And so, you know, like the one uh, fellow that was real, real disabled and had some real problems in the way he talked and stuff like that, he sat down next to a guy that was overweight, and comparatively the disabilities paled in comparison, and he put his finger in his chest and he said, listen here, fat boy, you're going to go to hell and burn like a grease ball if you don't stop quitting feeling sorry for yourself and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, I couldn't say that. But a disabled man that had been disabled since birth who had cerebral palsy did. But do you ever think of that? How is it a disabled person can be more grateful than me? I look around when I go to airports and go different places and so on and so forth and I see hundreds of thousands of people and they can see and they can taste and they can touch and they can smell and they can walk and they can talk and they can reach out and they can touch and they can grasp and they can turn things and they can feed themselves and they can go to the bathroom without going all over themselves. All of those things, I see all that stuff. It's an amazing deal. You're living in a nation right now that the repercussions of our wickedness are not as prevalent as you might think. You would think that a nation would be grateful for just a simple healthiness. Well, I'm getting old. Okay, everybody's getting old. That's part of what happens. Things wear out. My car's getting old. You say, what happens? It, it doesn't work like it used to. still works good. That, that's not a plug. I'm simply saying everything wears out. Why would you be different? But if we learn to say, you know what? Hey, Brother Tyrrell used to say this. It was profound. I'd say, Brother Terry, are you doing okay? He said, I'm doing okay. I could see him wincing in pain. He's like Brother Ernie yesterday trying to get down there. We were all feeling sorry for him. He takes him a minute or two to get down there on his knees uh, to paint the doors and stuff he was doing. And I uh, tried to get him. Brother Jake brought a little pad over there for him to get down there on his knees and stuff like that. And I'm looking at that. And Brother Terry would say, well, preacher, the way I look at it is, is that it is hurting, but if it ain't hurting, it ain't working. Praise the Lord. Amen. He said, I'd rather it be hurting and still working. I'm like, who'd have thought of that? Am I helping you at all? Yes, sir. Would you agree with me, at least at this point, at the midpoint or maybe three-quarter point, would you agree with me that the number one sin of American Christians is a lack of gratitude? Gratitude scientifically, it changes your biology according to a study done by Mayo Clinic. 
It blocks envy, resentment, frustration, aggravation, irritation, improves sleep, and it is the greatest exchange for self-pity that exists. That's from a doctor from Mayo Clinic. He said the greatest cure for self-pity is gratitude. The recommendation that another doctor said, and the lady who was just caught up in how bad everything was, how terrible everything is, how this is happening and that's happening, he said, ma'am, here's my prescription. He wrote down on his prescription pad, he said, I want you to go to the emergency room every day for a week and I want you to be there from 11 at night till 7 o'clock in the morning and come back and see me one week from today. She's like, what are you having me go there for? He said, I just want you to go there and do that kind of thing. And she went there and she came back and she said, I don't think I have it as bad as I thought I did. I think about the people that we visited for years at the nursing home. I can't imagine what it would be like to be caged up 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It's almost like solitary confinement. They're confined to a bed or they're confined to a wheelchair. And you know what? i got to be honest with you. I feel bad when I say, man, my knee's bothering me. It looks like you can still walk. Or my back hurts. Yeah, but you can still walk. I'm not getting on to you. For, I'm saying, do you balance the complaint out with, thank you, Lord, it's hurting, but it's still working. Yep. Amen. Amen. I sure appreciate it. Sure appreciate being able to go to a doctor, maybe get some relief. Beats the fire out of a wheelchair. Right. Amen. Beats the fire out of hell. Amen. How many times have you heard said, how are you today? Better than I deserve. I deserve being hell when my back broke. Well, my wife, she's a pain in the merhunkus. My kid's done gone prodigal. Business ain't no good. I can't half see, blind in one eye, can't see out the other eye. I, I thought you said you deserved being in hell. I thought you said you were doing good. I thought you said you're better than you deserve. And all I've heard is you just vomit how bad everything is. Well, do all things work together for good to them that love God, them that called according to His purpose or not? I don't see how God thinks this is good. It ain't your good. Right. It's what He says is good. I'll continue to write just a little bit. It proves your health, proven fact. Reduces, reduces your toxic emotions and cures, has been known to cure, say that the right way, depression. Reduces aggression. It increases your empathy toward other individuals. This particular individual was so convicted about what he said, he said, I am going to put ten coins in my pocket every day in my right pocket. And every time I compliment someone, every time I tell someone thank you, every time I do that, I'll take one coin out of this and put it over here. And until I've moved all ten coins out of my right pocket and into my left pocket. I'm not going home. I'm going to learn to train myself to find the good in other people. He said much to his surprise because he thought it would be easy. It's ten things, ten people, what's the big deal? He said, I was surprised I'd come to the end of the day when I first started the experiment and he said, I'd still have half the coins in my pocket. And I had talked to more than enough people to get rid of all ten coins. I know what you're thinking, that's compromise. See, it's not just about you, it is also about other people. And preacher, what you're saying is if I do these things, it's to my benefit. I'm trying to entice you to do it. But it requires effort. You have to train yourself. You know what he said? He said it took him a period of weeks to finally get to the point he no longer needed the coins. And people began to look at him and say, what happened to you? It didn't he became a terrible manager. He could no longer get things done. He just no longer needed a whip to get it done. Because people were motivated by his kindness. And he said in his memoirs, I wish I had learned the lesson of the ten coins a lot sooner in life. Because it's a lot less stressful. It reduces stress. Happier, healthier. Makes people like you more. And is a trait of a true fellowship with Jesus Christ. You're less self-centered. Increases your lifespan if you're interested in doing that. Physically in tests they did at the Mayo Clinic, they found out 
that it strengthens your immune system and makes you less likely for disease. They also discovered that it is the trait of spiritually minded people. Come, if you will, please, to Second Chronicles real quick. I'll try to put a bow on this. You know, it's an interesting thing when you study the Bible, you find out that the Lord says, Because thou servest not the Lord thy God, with joy and gladness of heart I will put a yoke of iron about your neck. What my, my job is, is, hey, thank the Lord I get to do anything. Amen. Right? Yeah. Not, I'm saddled with the responsibility of doing this. I had a job that I loved deeply. I liked going to work. I have a job now that I feel the same way. But I have to say, I don't pause often enough to say, Lord, thank you for saving me. Oh, yeah. Lord, thank you for calling me to preach. I'm pretty sure, isn't there difficulties and problems and different than that? Absolutely, there is. But he's the one that called me. I didn't get into it because it's. Roses and tulips and rainbows and unicorns. I did it because I couldn't believe he did it, but it's lost that enamoring. It's like he called me. Yeah. You know what amazes me? I look back. Sometimes y'all will come up with a little cassette thing, and it'll say like 2001. I'm like, oh, how did you get that out of the archives? That you shouldn't have that. I cannot believe the Lord did not slap me blind. I said and did some of the stupidest things. I learned, now what I say is not just, Lord, thank you for calling me. Thank you for putting up with me. Because Lord knows if I had somebody working for me the way I've worked for you, I'd have fired him a long time ago. I began to see myself, how he saw me. I don't think I brought anything to the party at all. Second Corinthians chapter or Second Chronicles, excuse me, chapter five. Before much longer, if Brother Holland keeps going and the money does come in, we get finished with the building, and I hope you'll help us with that. This is the dedicatory. This is Solomon's temple being dedicated. Now, would you agree with me before you read too much? Would you agree with me? I can give you all kind of illustrations about gratitude, but would you agree with me that Solomon is the wisest man on the earth? Is that, is that a fair statement? The Lord gave him that wisdom, right? He's even talked about Queen of Sheba, the wisdom, I mean, beyond anything you can imagine. Right? So Solomon is in charge of the dedication of the temple. So if Solomon has this put in the Bible, I would say it might be a key component to us understanding why God doesn't meet with us more often. In your personal life, in your family life, in your business life, and in your church life. I think it's right here in this passage. In 2 Chronicles chapter number 5, come down to verse number 13 in the interest of time. Could I ask you this question before we get too far down the road here? How was it they were able to get the temple built? I mean, even with what David had put up, ladies and gentlemen, it still wasn't enough to do the temple the way God wanted it done. It still required supernatural things and intervene. So how was it that they were able to get the temple built? You'd have to say, well, the Lord. Who gave him the blueprint? The Lord. Who told him every detail, including the lily work? The Lord. Who paved supernaturally the cedars of Lebanon, etc., etc., all that. Who provided that? Now watch what happens. They're now in the temple. 
And now the only thing missing is they need God there. David said, hey, I well dwell in a house that is a king's mansion, like a ransom, and you're out there dwelling in a tent. I want to build you a house. Imagine building this masterpiece, and the one you built it for never moves in. Could you imagine that? It'd be like, man, that, that's kind of disrespectful. <laughs> Spending millions, if not billions of dollars to get it built, and hey, your house is ready! And the Lord says, yeah, tent's good. So they're missing one thing. Can I show you how they bring God down? Can I say this? It wasn't by putting fire on the wood, water on the wood, to cause the fire to come down. There's something that happens in this passage that gets God's attention. Do you know why I think so? Because I think it is so rare. Because we are so selfishly motivated and we are all about us and we do it to the exclusion of Him. And guess what? Sometimes we don't have what we need. We got it, Lord. We don't need you. Verse 13, are you with me? It came to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound being heard in praising and... Oh, wait a minute. I think I'm remembering a psalm. Would that be Psalm 100? Would that be verse 3? No, be verse 4. Enter into His gates with praise... And let's see if the principle applies here. They lifted up their voice and they praised the Lord saying, For He is good. His mercy endureth forever. Then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. So the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Why? What did they do? They were praising and thanking the Lord. They weren't confessing their sins. They weren't praying for lost people to be saved and other nations to be turned, deliverance from their enemies. You know what they were saying? The Lord is good. His mercy endureth forever. Praise the Lord. Boy, what a blessing God has been to me. I got some Ebenezer stones in my life. Some stones that had been dug out of some Jordans along the way. You know what they say? Hitherto hath the Lord, not us, helped me. That's a stone to remember. I got you through there, didn't I, boy? Yes, sir. How many times I've had roofing nail theology. Working about six stories up, a 412 pitch, kind of steep, foot slips and start sliding. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, help me, oh God, help me, oh God. I'll do anything, oh God. And somebody didn't nail down the roof all the way and left their tack sticking up and it grabs my britches. Never mind, Lord, nail got me. That's roof and nail theology. Instead of knowing that the Lord took His finger down there and pushed that nail up and made it grab my britches. I realize the message today is not one of great excitement. I don't know that it really should be. I've got a list of at least 15 or so illustrations of gratitude, but it's not intended to show you anything that shouldn't become natural. It should just be learning how to have the common courtesy, the common decency, to just simply be able to tell the Lord, thank you for all things. Not just the good things. Job says at the beginning of his trial when his wife confronts him, I'm not too awful hard on her, but he, she says, curse the Lord and die. I can imagine you probably wouldn't feel much like living after losing ten kids and everything else you have. And you know what he said? He said, we've received good from the Lord. Shall we not receive evil also? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hey, baby, we've been treated good. 
God's been good to us. God's really watched out for us. Well, some bad things are happening. Yeah, but God's still good. Yeah, but it's not, it's, it's not I, but God's been good. And God will find His way here. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask you a question. If God spoke to you, Miss Pat will make her way to the organ here and play softly in just a moment. If God spoke to you, should I have to try to encourage you to just be thankful? Or shouldn't it be a thing that all of us as Christians recognize that our Christianity is lacking? Oh, not just being thankful for good things, all things. Would you be in the one or would you be in the nine? Would you be guilty of the sin of ingratitude, thankfulness? Do you use that as a bait and switch or as a stick and a carrot to try to tell the Lord, well, I'll be thankful when you get in line and you do what I want you to do. Until then, I'm going to withhold my thanks. Do you take Him for granted? Maybe you got some bad things going on right now. Have you taken Him for granted? When good things were there, were you praising Him and thanking Him for it? And now that the bad things are here, are you cursing Him for it? I don't know what you're going through. I can imagine some of you are going through some unbelievably difficult things. God is still good. Even if you wind up with Daniel in the lion's den, the three Hebrew children in a fiery furnace. God is still good. The question is not about whether or not He's good. The question is, are you obedient? Miss Pat's going to play. Many people have already come. If God spoke. Preacher, what should I pray? Why don't you just start by saying, Lord, thank you. You'll be absolutely astonished how many things begin to come to your mind. Thank you for the clothes on my back. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this Bible. Thank you for being able to pray. Thank you for my health. Thank you for my children. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my car. Thank you that my Maypops didn't pop on the way here. Thank you for making me sick so I'd rest. Thank you, Lord, for you fill in the blank. You'd be absolutely astonished if you start doing it. How your prayer will literally change, but it will also change you.